Okay, violence in the media. I don't think the media now is necessarily more violent than it ever used to be. I think the difference now is about access to it. So I don't think it's necessarily about the what is being produced. I think it's the fact that an eight-year-old lad can pretty much have access to anything on his mobile phone in the playground. I think that's what's changed. I think that's the problem and the issue, not necessarily what's being produced. I mean, what's produced for consenting adults with an 18 certificate on the assumption that a grown-up person is going to watch it is different, isn't it? I mean, I think that was always the issue. Is like, you know, when I was a lad back in the medieval times, you know, if you could manage to watch an X certificate film, you know, that was the ultimate thing, you know, I watched an X certificate because you, you couldn't get hold of them, you couldn't buy them. You know, it'd be like you know, a mate of a mate's dad had left it around and they'd nicked it from the video shelf and brought it round or something. And I, do I think that was better? I kind of do, really. I think it was better that it was harder to get hold of stuff. But did it make it more attractive that it was harder? Yes, it did. So, I don't know, I think... Ultimately, I think the solution to whatever the problem is, is about education, and I think that's the thing that we don't know how to do. It, my age range, even your age range, if you, like, if you became primary school teacher in three years' time, would you know how to educate an eight-year-old lad how to self-monitor what they watched? I don't know how you teach that, because ultimately that's what it's got to come down to, isn't it? If you can get anything on your device, then it's only you that can decide whether you watch something or not. So, I don't know, it's like, I remember one of my friends um, said, you know, sort of my, my age mate, said that somebody had passed them a mobile phone in the pub and said, I'd look at this. And it was, a, it was a 10 second video, but it was an actual beheading, a real life one. And he said he looked at it before he'd realized what it was. And he's like, Fuck, what did you show me that for? And they just thought it was a bit of a laugh, but it was a proper snuff movie that somebody had got and passed around. And it's like, he said, I, just, I don't think I ever felt the same again. It's like, you, I think the problem is you can't take it out once you put it in to your brain. So do I, do I think that if somebody watches something violent and that means they're going to go out and be like that? Not really. If somebody watches somebody being raped, they're going to go out and rape somebody? I don't really think like that. If somebody's a bit mentally unstable and they watch something like that, could it affect the way they behave? Yeah, obviously. But you can't kind of make everything on the assumption that it might be accidentally watched by an eight-year-old lad or a psycho, can you? Otherwise, we'd just end up with a world of friends and rom-coms and, you know, <laughs> they're worse than Hitler themselves, aren't they? Um, but going back to your kind of forbidden fruit, analogy I guess um, do you think that that might contribute to this violent behaviour though because cause from a young age you're kind of being naughty and stealing these parents or waiting until your parents leave to like watch these things do you think that that may be kind of be the start to it if you so if someone's kind of has that in their head already and then they're being naughty and then they get bored of that so then they move on to the next thing do you yeah, think that yeah no definitely because you know back in the olden days in medieval times when I was at school if you were cool, you were down the back alley having a fag with the cool people. And, um, you know, so if you smoked from anywhere up to, from 11 to 16, you went down the back alley at school and, and all the smokers in the school knew each other because they were the naughty ones. Well, you weren't really being particularly naughty, but it did create a subcultural thing of its own. And it did have a kind of membership... Um, yeah, you didn't tell any. It had a sort of cult status in a, in a way. People who didn't smoke or weren't brave enough to go down the back alley knew who did, but nobody would ever tell on anybody else because that was that was you know, it was like a mini mafia thing really. Mm -hmm. It was all a bit pathetic school stuff, but I, I do think you learn something from that. That if you if you're in with the cool kids, then you are, and if you're not, you're not. But I also think in relation to your subject that people who don't feel very powerful in their lives know instinctively that it's easy to be destructive and it's easy to get noticed for being destructive. I mean, people always used to say that thing about the space shuttle, like, you know, 
it takes uh, you know whatever ten years to build a space shuttle and three seconds for it to blow up. I think a lot of things are like that. It's like it's easy to do something to do a, a lot of damage quickly, and if you live in a culture where it's easy to get hold of a gun, then you know it's inevitable, isn't it? I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often, really. Yeah. So, as a parent, um, do you think violence is shown too often on TV? I mean, you said kind of it's more has to do with ac- access to it, but because like smartphones and stuff like that are, I mean, pretty much everyone has one. Do you think that that's almost getting too far now with the kind of how much violence they see in the mainstream media? Is it a concern to you or? Well, I've, my, my daughter's sort of same age as you, so she's coming up, she's 22. She's got a brother, Arthur, her half brother, he's 15. So with Becky, um, I never really, I never really worried about it with her because she's not really attracted to that kind of stuff and she doesn't really like weird films either. So by and large, she just stays clear of it herself. Whereas with her brother, Arthur, he, from the moment he could draw at three, if he drew a monster, it'd have half of its head missing and, you know, an axe in its back. Do you know what I mean? It was just instant. It always been in his imagination. And now he spends probably half of his life on World of Warcraft or one of those running around shooting everything games. And do I worry about that? I kind of do a little bit because I think I'm not sure Arthur knows the difference between... Now, he's not going to run around with a machine gun, but some of the language that he gets used to saying... I mean, I think it's amazing now that you can sit there play a game and he's got his headset on and I'm looking at him in the living room and he's chatting to four mates online and they're all running around and somebody's asking to join and then he's deciding with his mates whether they let this other lad join and then they're in this virtual... I mean, that's pretty amazing technology. But then what they're doing with it is running around shooting each other and swearing a lot and being a bit stupid, really. I just think it's a bit stupid. I don't think it enhances his intelligence. I think it probably improves his motor coordination a bit and gives him a strange sort of virtual social life from the living room, but I don't think it enhances anything very much. And I'm always disappointed by computer games because I think, is that it? Is that all we can invent, things where you run around shooting things? Or maybe a puzzle game or something like that, but surely there's other kinds of things that you could do with a computer game. Mm -hmm. So do you think, say... I mean, heaven forbid, Arthur goes out and does something awful, like shoot someone. Would you would it would you find comfort in blaming the media or blaming this video game or blaming a certain movie he watched or music he listens to? Yeah, I mean, I don't see the thing is that's so hypothetical, isn't it? Because I don't think Arthur would go out and do that, but I think he might be on the playground and start going yo motherfucker to some chap on the swings because mm. he thinks it's funny and hard, and he might get twatted as a result of it. And then he'd have to learn his lesson, wouldn't he? That it's probably best not to say that. Yeah. So I don't know. I think, I think the trouble is, if somebody starts to behave in a way that they pretend they're hard when they're not, it soon gets sorted out in the playground by sort of natural selection, doesn't it? But as soon as you start introduce the possibility of actual weaponry into that situation, then it does change completely. And I mean, you know, there's plenty of inner city schools in this country where, you know, they, they have metal detectors on the doors these days because people are taking knives to school. I mean, that didn't used to be the case. I mean, is that something to do with what people see or not? I don't really know. I think, I think that's the difficult thing to pick apart is the t- times change. People have got access to more different stuff. People are aware. I mean, look, I, when I was 17 in medieval times, I'd never heard of drugs. I'd never heard of them. Didn't know they existed at 17. Can you imagine that? I mean, just nobody had ever mentioned it. They weren't on the news. They weren't on the telly. Nobody had ever said that they existed. So times have really, really changed a lot. Everybody's heard of everything now. Everybody's seen pornography. Everybody's seen, you know, what looks like real-life violence. And 
I do think if you got into if you get into like child psychology and how brains actually develop, you're not meant to get that stuff early on. It's not an arbitrary thing. I think it has been a bit arbitrary that we say after eighteen, you know, you're capable of seeing anything. But I certainly think at eleven, twelve, thirteen, you shouldn't be seeing that kind of stuff. I don't think it helps a teenage lad in particular develop in a more rounded way. Or just like super skunk or that sort of stuff that's floating around now. I just think it's really bad for teenage lads. You know, there's a lot of different elements to it, isn't there, really? Yeah. Okay, so the case studies that we have, the main one is Jamie Bulger? James Bulger? James Bulger, yeah. Bulger. Okay. Um, and that sort of crime or whatever is blamed on child's play. And then there's things like the Batman or the shooting at the Batman thing being blamed on Batman and stuff like that. Um, do you agree with this blame on like when they choose like with Columbine with Marilyn Manson music? If, do you agree with that specific? No, blame? I don't agree with any of them to be honest. Because I think you know, look, I mean, in the 1950s, you know, somebody might have had to get some kind of weird comic or something. You know, I don't know. It's not. You can't kind of take away from the world anything that could possibly give somebody who is a psycho some ideas, can you? Mm. I mean, even if it is the case that they've sat there, you know, two lads have sat in their bedroom and gone, mm, we're a bit bored, what should we do? Oh, let's watch that film. Oh, that's a good idea. Let's go and do that. Chances are they're probably not healthy, rounded kids to have that idea in all likelihood. So... <coughs> Excuse me. If somebody comes from a, a background of abuse and vi- and violence, and they're not very happy, and they don't really know who they are, and they can't really see much future for themselves, and they see something in a film, or really it could just be a comic, or they hear it on a record or whatever, and they just go, oh, yeah, let's do that. I don't know. That's like. You know, that's like blaming gravity for falling down, isn't it? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's like, where, where to draw the line? I mean, this is, you know more about this than I do. I mean, in American, American culture is very renowned for kind of suing people for, you know, I've become clinically obese where I'm going to sue McDonald's because it's their fault. I mean, it's like, where do you draw the line? Yeah. Um, about social networks, it's kind of like the, the media is, we live in a time where everything's amplified so you know my thing that I always go on about is like you lot go out for a night you'll take a camera with you you'll take 20 photos each of each other in the nightclub doing your funny stuff you all upload them that's a hundred photos and you've just gone out and got pissed and come home I mean how does that merit a hundred photos online it just completely bemuses me that is amplifying something ridiculous to ridiculous proportions. So then when you've actually got something that is a story, which is what the media always did anyway, tabloid press have always amplified nothing, you know, somebody sleeps with somebody, so what? You know, that can last two weeks in a tabloid press, can't it, as a story. Wow, somebody slept with somebody, that's amazing, fancy that. A model's taking cocaine, God, would you believe it? That's amazing, would you ever thought of Kate Moss taking cocaine? Wow, that's a story. You know, it's like, it's just a lot about something about nothing. But so, with regards to kind of the Batman thing, though, do you think it kind of gives these pe- these criminals, like, a platform, in a way, because it kind of, in a way, gives them their 15 minutes of fame? Because they're doing this to spark a reaction, and then Twitter's going crazy, hashtag worldwide, mm. this, that, and the other, because of something that happened in a small town in Colorado. Obviously, it's awful and was going to make big headlines, but in a way, Twitter and Facebook almost make it that much more popular and that much more known about it. Yeah, they do, but at the same time, you know, if you look at Arab Spring and the Occupy thing, then Facebook and Twitter suddenly became useful tools. You know, when you've got a government who's turned the internet off and is severely repressing its people and suddenly social networking and some people who know how to turn the internet back on are kind of 
redressing the balance. I mean, you can use anything for anything. It's not like they're bad things in themselves. It's a demo, it's a, a democratic tool of spreading information amongst people, and that's a good thing, by and large. But it depends what the information is. If it's shit information, you know, if it's Kate Moss has done coke, woo, surprise. If it's the Egyptian government's turned the internet off and it's repressing its people, then that's good that that information comes out, isn't it? Isn't that it? You can't really blame the tools for the way that people use them. That's like somebody, it's somebody with a hammer. It's not the hammer's fault, is it? That's, that's really what it comes down to, blaming a record or blaming a film. I mean, it's just silly. Yeah. I mean, I don't think things like Twitter are blamed. I think that they just make it, they, almost, they don't, don't blame it, but they almost promote it. So yeah, they like, magnify it. Yeah. So instead of these people doing these things unnoticed, because you really shouldn't bring attention to someone for doing something hard. They are, in a way, made famous. Everyone knows the guy's face that did the Batman shooting because it was plastered everywhere. Or like Coney. Everyone knows about Coney just because it was like a really clever video on YouTube. But this is something to do with human nature, isn't it? I mean... People like to be critical and people like to gossip. Imagine if, you know, I don't know. Imagine if the same thing happened because somebody did something really great for no apparent reason. You know, say some millionaire decided to just open a soup kitchen in Brighton. They spent all of the money on it and gave 50 people a job for a year and said, there you go, it's yours, and don't mention it. I don't, I don't want this in the press. And then that became a story. That would be quite nice. But that isn't how things work, is it? The way things work is you get a programme on telly called The Secret Millionaire. You're not a secret. You're on national TV showing off about having some money, going, oh, look at me, I've given some away. That's not a secret millionaire. That's a self-promoting guilty millionaire. Yeah. So I don't know, it's like, this is a big topic that is about human nature and community and, you know, in personal development circles they, they say that people are only critical when they don't feel good about themselves. That's it, it's as simple as that. So if people don't feel good about themselves in their own lives, they're going to be critical of other people and the easiest way to have a profile and for everybody to know who you are is to do something destructive. So, going back to the Bulger thing, um, kind of comparing that with Batman, a long time ago, 15, 20 years ago, um, and now suddenly the discussions are shifting from this Charles Blay play blame to like what was actually going on behind closed doors like in, his, in their families and yeah. stuff like that. Whereas with the Batman shooting, initially, like the full, it was full blown, he was the Joker, this, that, and the other, and then it, it's already shifted to like, wait, no, but his psychology psychologist said this, and the, how, like, why do you think this blame has shifted throughout the years to kind of, now it's less on the media in a way, it's more, that's like kind of the quick, easy answer, and then it shifts to things more behind the scenes? Well, because the reason why we get blame culture is because nobody wants to take responsibility, and, you know, it wasn't very long ago that responsibility was a very simple thing, it was up to your parents, and it was up to the school, and if you didn't get it then, from some, you know, your parents and your school giving it their best shot, there was probably something wrong with you. Mm. It was simple. I'm not saying that was right, but that's how people saw it. Well, it's really complicated to live in today's times. I mean, I don't think we know how to educate our children for the times that we live in anymore. In anything, to do, in any education... I mean, I'm an educational reformist. I honestly would burn the whole lot to the ground and start from scratch again, from infant school right way up to degree level. I don't think we teach people how to be emotionally equipped to live in the times that we live in. I don't think we do. I don't think we know how to. So for me, that's the issue. And of course, the easiest thing to do is go, well, that was their fault, or that's because of drugs, or that's because they live next door to an Asian family who'd nicked all their jobs or that's because they read that comic or listened to that record. I mean, you know. If we lived in a planet that came from a place of we have a collective responsibility to look after our children, which is the world's children, that would be a different point of view to approach it from. Well, we don't come from that point of view. 
we're still arguing about bits of land and we look at Israel at the moment, it's a mess, everything's a mess. Mm -hmm. So in the middle of all that lot, fighting over bits of land, who's going to have the time to, to think forward enough to think, like, how do we educate the next generation to be the ones in charge of this mess that we've made in 30 years' time? That would be a more interesting way of looking at it.